Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, my name's Dave Rodden. Uh, I'm 28 and two days old. Um, I'm, and I'm a writer originally from Cavan, but now living in Dublin. Um, I've always loved stories and in general. So I'm constantly like reading and like, watching TV and watching films and like looking at how there's those stories are told and constantly kind of like taking them apart and I'm like, oh, that's how they did this. And oh, this is how they like tried out this thing. And how would I do it if I was doing that? So sort of like, I feel when you're a writer, you have to set yourself up as sort of a, a radar dish or antenna. So like you're constantly aware of people's relationships, um, things you see around you, ways of describing things. So you're sort of like always kind of attuned and then something might crop up that you could like write a story about. My process is I have long conversations in my head for ages. I, I don't drive, so I tend to walk everywhere, which leaves a lot of time for listening to extremely loud music. And that's sort of where the process begins. I turn scenes over and over in my head. Uh, I try out different characters, I try out different lines of dialogue. And so when I actually do sit down, I have a fairly good idea of what's going to happen. Um, my first draft then is sort of the kitchen sink draft. It's where I throw in everything possible, things I know aren't going to work and things I know aren't like fully polished. Uh, but the first draft for me is all about creation. Then my second draft is when I go back and I take out all the things that don't work and I polish things. And because it's already down on the page, I feel I can take more time with each scene, so I really kind of polish and craft it then, and that's where like the actual novel comes out of. I used to just write when the mood struck me or when it was easy, and I think that's how a lot of people start off. You get this amazing idea and you just have to write it down, and even though it's long and difficult and a lonely process, you feel you, feel you have to do it. Uh, and writer's block is when you just don't have that, where like you don't have an impetus, you know what you're going to write is bad before you write it, so you don't write it. Um, the thing about being a professional writer, the thing about doing, wanting to do it for a job is you can't allow writer's block to happen. Like you need to write when it's not fun, you need to write when it's hard. It's better to be writing when it's hard than if you just wrote when it was really easy and the words just like burned out of you onto the page, then you'd be writing like once every like three or four years. Like so you need to like sort of iron that part of yourself out. I'm not saying that it always happens or that it's easy, but you have to force your way through it. Uh, a particular trick of mine is to have two or three writing projects on the go. So if I hit a roadblock with one, I just switch over to a different one and that's different enough that I can get around the writer's block and then I can go back to the first project then after that. The synopsis of the story is, um, it's the story of an ancient war between a race of extra dimensional, shape-shifting, misery-eating, waistcoat-wearing monsters called Tenebrous and the Knights of the Borrowed Dark, who are an ancient order who are sworn to, def who's sworn to fight them. Uh, into all of this comes 13-year-old Denison Hardwick, who has read the kind of books where kids are expected to save the world and wants absolutely no part of it. He numbers his friends. He's extremely stressed. The uh, For this trilogy, I know exactly where. It all comes down to one line, uh, which I'm not telling you, uh, obviously. Um, when I was first writing them, there were certain events and certain moments in the book were definitely kind of like down but a lot of the surrounding all of the connective tissue I guess is still kind of amorphous so like I know how it ends but the journey is still kind of being decided there are certain questions I get asked a lot uh that you sort of get used to asking so people ask you know you know how did you come up with the idea or uh how was your what's your process things people don't ask you um did it drive you insane <laughs> it's one of the questions that I don't get asked enough like it's funny, because it's done now and because it's gone through 14 drafts, uh, it's a finished, polished thing. And I guess people don't sort of realise that there are times there's a slump at about 30,000 words and about 40,000 words where you're so far away from the beginning that it doesn't feel new anymore, but you're not close enough to the end for it to feel like you're ever going to get there. And so for all of the loveliness and for all of the, the nice moments where kids tell you you love the book, there were an awful lot of days where I just walked around town miserable thinking I would never be able to finish it. I was doing an event recently and uh, one of the kids had read the first chapter of the book and I was like, so what are your favourite books? And this kid was like, this book is my favourite book. And I was like, you've read one chapter, <laughs> thank you. And I, I just blushed and went, thank, thank you, thanks very much. Uh, I've had people cry uh, when, they've read the, when they've read the books and that's pretty amazing. Like the idea that I could like, which is it's the whole reason I write in the first place, is the idea that I could move somebody. I've always loved stories and there are things that I've seen in books and film that have really affected me and changed who I am as a person and the idea of being able to do that for somebody else is magnificent. 
So I started writing. I started writing fan fiction first because I had no idea how to write. And I'm a huge fan of fantasy and world building. But to try and teach myself sentence structure, character development, and come up with the kind of intricate and amazing worlds that I was used to seeing in, in books already, that was a lot. So with fan fiction, there's a sense that some of the work is done for you, like the tools are there, like the, the furniture is there and you get to like work around that. So that's why I started with fan fiction. I did that for a couple of years uh, on various forums online and made some really great friends, some really like uh, lovely kind of a, had a great kind of support system starting off where we would read and edit each other's work. Uh, then there was a point where I was 80,000 words into this particular saga of this character uh, in set in the warmer 40k universe and my laptop died and I lost all of it. So at that point I had already started to realise that fan fiction, I mean it's changing now but you can't really make a career out of writing fan fiction. So I was, was like well this is my chance, I'm going to try writing original, we're going to put my kind of my talent on the line here. So I did that for another four years and I wrote as I said before I wrote when the mood took me I wrote when it was easy I wrote when it was fun uh, I began to realize then though that this wasn't viable so my logic was that if I believed that I could be a writer if I believed that this was a thing that I could do for the rest of my life it was time to go big or go home so I said I'd take a year out I would spend a year and seven grand doing this masters and if I don't get in I kind of have an answer and if I don't do well I kind of have an answer uh, I managed to get in uh, I wrote the book during the Masters, I met some fantastic people, I got some really great advice from my lecturers and I wrote Nights of the Bar of Jack, which at the time was called uh, The Clockwork Three. Uh, I wrote the first draft in that Masters and then um, when it was at the point of being a second draft and I thought it was fairly polished, I sent it off to 25 agents. 23 said no, one read the whole thing and then said no and one said yes. Uh, Claire Wallace and Darley Anderson, uh, who was great. And she and I did another draft together, a third draft where we plugged up some of the, the holes that she could see that I couldn't see. And then we, on January 31st, uh, she said, okay, I'm gonna send it out. Do you want to know who I'm sending it to? And I said, no, because I'll go crazy. Uh, so uh, she said, okay, now just so you know, uh, this process could take months. Uh, we mightn't hear anything for a very long time. I need you to understand that now. And I was like, okay, cool. 13 days later, on my birthday actually, uh, I got a phone call uh, where she said, um, I'm not going to try and do the accent. Uh, she's like, you know, I've a little, bit of, a little bit of a birthday present for you, Dave. And she told me that the uh, the German rights had sold for the book. Um, and then a, day, a couple of days after that, when I was in a like a, a pound world shop, uh, like a euro, one of those two euro shops on Georgia Street, and myself and my girlfriend at the time were debating whether we would spend our remaining euro on this fancy type of dried soup or whether we buy the cheap 50 cent soup and then get a roll as well. And she rang and said that um, Penguin had made an offer for the book. And I was like, okay, what, what, what do you think we should do? And she was like, well, I think we should take it, Dave. <laughs> so uh, everything sort of kind of happened from there. Um, I met a fantastic editor, Ben, at Penguin, and we worked on, it was funny, I thought most of the work would be done. Uh, so when he read it, it was draft four. And I remember him ringing me and saying, Dave, I think it's very cute that you call this draft four because here at Penguin, we would really consider this the first draft. 10 drafts, 12, 12 drafts later, uh, copy edits and line edits and the American edit. Uh, and we finally have the, the finished copy. Uh, so yeah. someone like Dave and actually I think it's probably going to be a highlight of my career it certainly has been so far just in terms of um, the deals that we've done for Dave and just I mean Dave's talent is extraordinary um, he's so young he's got so much energy and so many ideas lots of things come very naturally to him um, so the things we look for are, uh, a character and pace and obviously really good story but it's always character first and the way that Dave brought Denison to life and the characters that he wrote, we don't see that very often. And so for us, it was a very, very easy yes, please, when we read Dave's work.
yes, yes, it came to me about three o'clock um, one afternoon and I took it home and I read it that night. Um, and while I was reading it, there was a power cut. Uh, and so I was actually reading it by candlelight for quite a lot of it, which if you read the book, if you know some of the story, uh, is quite, sort of quite fitting. So when I, when I got to the, sort of the point where the candles sort of all came into the story, it was a bit like, gosh, this is, this is rather spooky and slightly serendipitous. I think I, I think I have to have this book. Uh, so I sort of kind of, I kind of knew just from the story, but then that was a little, a little added nudge from somewhere. Very hopeful for the future. I've seen the second book, um, which I think is being edited now. Um, and I haven't seen the third yet, although I think Dave's a fair way into writing it. And I know what happens at the end. Um, so yeah, we have huge, huge high hopes for Dave. Uh, the reception that he's had so far has been incredible and really the sky's the limit for him. Um, the book's been sold into translation and film rights have sold. And so, and it's also been a really long run in. So the book was sold uh, in 2014. And so Dave's been very patient. It's been a long wait for in today, really. And so it's just the beginning for him. It's a nice mirroring of Dave's story, really, from someone who worked incredibly hard for a long time and took a risk and got by on nothing um, to reach this level of success. It's kind of every author's dream. And Dave's a lovely example of how you can do it. Um, I was roped into being the judge at the Bram Stoker Festival for, a, uh, for an event that involved a, a literary death match. So there were three performers who were due to come up, none of whom I knew at the time and two of whom I've known since then. And each of them came up and performed in front of a room full of people in the theatre downstairs something that they'd written themselves. And they had to perform it. This wasn't about reading, this was a performance-based thing. Uh, Two of them were very good, one of whom immediately after he had performed what he was doing on the night that he had written, the two other judges and I had to put our heads together and go, it's him, isn't it? Yeah, it's that guy. It's, he's the one who's going to win. We need, we need to pretend that we're having some sort of proper deliberation here. <laughs> it's going to look unseemly if we make him the winner immediately. That's going to be, I don't think you know that. Um, but we, we, we actually said rhubarb, rhubarb, rhubarb for about two minutes. <laughs> because you don't want to make anybody else feel bad. And Dave was the winner of, of that that night. And afterwards, you know, the, the couple of glasses of wine, and I, I, I chat with Dave afterwards and kind of said, you know, well, what is it, you know, what, what are you doing right now? And he said, oh, I kind of have this book thing written. And it's, and, you know, immediately you have a conversation with somebody, and lots of people have book things written, and you don't imagine that some night you're going to be standing here introducing it to an enormous room full of people like this. Um, I, I read the book a couple of months ago. There is that grand relief when it's somebody that you know, and uh, kind of, I, I know Dave since, since then, particularly online. It's that relief of going, oh, thank Christ, it's brilliant. Oh, thank <laughs> God. Oh. This is just my job to introduce him tonight. I'm genuinely honored to do it. I, I get asked to do these things every now and then, but you only really do it if you really love what you're being asked to introduce, and I genuinely do. So please make it rapturous in this wonderful surrounds, in this an enormous hall. Please put your hands together for the man that we are all here for tonight, Mr. Dave.